Encounters with the police department for some people are not always pleasant experiences. But this is not the case when I had the pleasure of sitting down with Hingham Police Chief Glenn Olson. Boy, did we have a chat in his office that was a lot of fun that included discussion about the rivalry with his brother Robert, recently retired from the Hingham Fire Department, his love for his grandchildren, the early influences in his career. But we also found ourselves having some rather interesting and courageous conversations that included discussions about the talk and all lives matter. Hi, Chief Olson. Hi, how you doing? Joe nice Collymore. to see you. Nice Hi, to Joe. see you, and thank you very much for sitting down with me today. And, and let's just talk about you, your background, your career in policing. And um, I also want to make sure that I take some time to just sort of get a sense for what your vision is for uh, your legacy and what you'd like to leave here with the police department at that point in time when you follow your brother. Uh, Robert into yeah, retirement. Yeah, that <laughs> so I, as I understand it now, you're one of three boys. You got two three, brothers. Three boys and a sister. Yeah. Three yeah. boys and a sister. Yeah. And so, uh, based on the background, at least that I was able to sort of glean, um, your brother Robert yep. recently retired as chief of the fire department. Yes. After. 40 something years, 35 40, years? 40 or 41 years. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And then you have a brother, David. David, yep. And uh, he briefly as well went yeah. to the department? David was on the fire department for about seven or eight years. Um, and then he migrated back out into the construction field. And um, now he's like, has a limo company down in Bourne. Bourne or, yeah, Bourne, I think he's running out of. And your sister? Uh, my sister is, uh, has a very large family and it uh, seems that uh, we, my mother and I always refer if there's a baby in the family somewhere, you'll find my sister. She just loves kids and spends all the time with them and, um, and she's at a good point. She lives in Norwell, so we're still all close in the area. You know. So you're the youngest of the three boys, but your sister's the youngest. No, in the I, oh, okay. I, my mother will probably say that I'm the baby. I try to like, you know, and she tells everybody that it's a little bit embarrassing at times, but it's a good position to be in the family. I think. All right. My, okay. my brothers and sisters took all the aggravation, and I came along and knew what to do and what not to do. How did you get into law enforcement? And as I understand it, you kind of reluctantly found yourself in that. Is that correct? Yeah, in a, in a lot of different ways. I um, I knew that like college was not a, a, a big option for me. I really was never much of a student. Um, I was mechanically inclined, um, building. I worked for carpenters. I worked on cars. Um, so I ended up um, sort of during that time, I became friendly with people that were actually involved in law enforcement. Um, one of my friends, uh, Glenn Shaw, who was on this department at the time, was a special, and we used to ride motorcycles together, work on cars, and, um, you know, I, I started sort of learning about law enforcement in that respect, and uh, he had a friend that was a New Hampshire state trooper, so we would go up to New Hampshire, and we went on four-wheel drive expeditions up mountains, and we hunted and snowmobiled, and had a great time, you know, and I always remember him um, getting ready for work, and he was a Vietnam veteran. He was like six foot two, big guy, and every day he'd be polishing his buttons before he went off to work, and, you know, he was very devoted to his job. And, you know, that I would see those kind of things, and it always sort of stuck in my mind, and um, I, I sort of started thinking, well, you know, this could be a career for me. I, I thought about the service, but I 
didn't really want to leave. Uh, that's sort of how I became involved in the police department. I took the civil service test and um, ended up coming on in 1980. So. And you've been here in the Hingham Police Department for now coming up on how many years? Oh, it's 1980, so we're looking at wow. almost 39 30, years almost now. Almost 39 so. years. I, I got I to beat that 41 of my brothers. That's my goal. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> There's all no right. Comp competition between us, but I got to do better than that. You know. Now, you've been chief since 2015, so now you've just come past your, your third anniversary. Yes, correct, yeah. And uh, how's it feel being chief? I really enjoy the job. I think it's a very challenging job. I, I like, you know, I, it, it's, I spend a lot of time working at it. I, I, you know, I truly want to do a good job. I'm making the efforts and I, you know, I, I look at it as that the future of the Hingham Police Department is sort of what we're going to make of it. So we're trying to sort of see what the future visions are going to be. And I, I think policing right now, and what I'm trying to get people to understand is that we're in a field of change. Um, you know, I sort of look back at the 60s and I see what happened in the 60s. And then I look at what's happening now and I see a real parallel there. Tell me more about what you mean by that. Well, I think uh, the world was, it, every once in a while, it's been 50 years since the 60s. And I think we have a generation out there um, that's sort of looking for some causes, I, I think. And like all generations want to have causes. And I think what's going on out in the world nowadays mm -hmm. People are frustrated from a lot of different reasons, and yeah, I mean, it's way too many to get into. Um, government isn't really functioning the way it probably should function. So I think people are sort of going like, you know, where's my life going to be? What's my future going to be? And um, so they're, they're looking for those causes, and I think, you know, if we don't try to direct them and, and work with them, you know, uh, and we saw in the 60s the way the police departments responded. Mm. And it was just, it was pitiful. I mean, when I look back at some of the films and the, you know, I mean, it just, you know, during, during the stuff down in Alabama and stuff, and when a bus mm -hmm. pulls up and people get out and they get beat by the police, you know, and it, I look at those kind of things and I can see where that deep-rooted feelings come from. It takes generations to go away. And we've got to start that process now. And the only way we're going to do it is by making police departments more professional. Um, and being out in the open and, and dealing with the issues as we see them. One of the things that I noticed um, about your leadership is people often describe you as being dedicated. You're passionate about your work and you're compassionate and you're accountable. Uh, are these qualities and values that you are extending throughout your department and, and how are you going about that from training uh, the next generation of officers coming on board. Well, well, thank you. I, I sort of hope that is the way people see me. I'm sure there's people see me a different way at times, too. But, you know, I think this is what we need to be. And I, you know, when I first took over as chief, one of the things is that I talked about to the staff was uh, the presidential report. Every so often a presidential report comes out. And it sort of hammered into these things. Um, it was a 21st century report on policing. and. It talked about, for years, it talked about us being the guardians of the community. And what it sort of meant is that we needed to look out for the, we, we needed to not just be the protectors, but we needed to look out on a more higher level and be more understanding and take care of ourselves and be involved with the community. It sort of goes back to the roots of the original community policing. Hingham's very, as always, we've been very fortunate that we have a department that's really entrenched in community policing. We're always out doing things with the community. Mm -hmm. um, just like right now, we're wearing the, the pink patch. Yes. Um, and it, that's, you know, for breast cancer awareness. And it's also a way for us to attach uh, with the community because when you're wearing this, so many people, like, ask you about it. They come out and say, hey, what, what's with the patch? Uh, I, Laughingly, I almost had someone ask me if I did my own laundry, and I'm there like, no, why? And they said, well, I think you mixed your stuff up. <laughs> like you put the reds in, you know, uh, with the wash. I go, no, no, no. So I had to explain to them. But, you know, we talk about engaging with the community. So, you know, every chance you get as an officer to get out of your cruiser and engage with the community is, is a way to let people know that you're, you're, you're a person, you're, you're, not, you're not just a uniform. That's an interesting point. Um, you talk about 
the average citizen, perhaps the, uh, the institution that they come in contact with, either it's hospitals, schools, or first responders, whether it's the, the fire or the police department, and you want those initial experiences to be positive experiences so that at least that doesn't cloud and bias how they see uh, that institution uh, in the future, how yeah, it shapes yeah. their point of view, if that makes sense? Yeah, exactly, because, you know, most people for the majority of time probably don't have any encounters with the police department. Um, you, you want those encounters to be as positive as possible, even when there's a bad thing going on. It doesn't have to be a negative encounter. You've still got to have respect for people. You've got to treat them fairly. Tell me a bit about the uh, Citizens Police Academy. Um, I'd like to have you share a little bit more about how that's structured and how citizens can become involved in that, if that's possible. Well, that, that, that's a great, uh, we, that's a very, really proud program. It was started uh, by Chief Mills back when we were in the old station on Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Street. I think he was a is sergeant. Is that when that sign is? You see that yeah, sign? Yeah, that's that the old basically sign? that used to be on the state, the uh, sign on the, the Lincoln Street station, yeah. Okay. And uh, we recently just had it restored. Uh, so it looks a lot better than it did. It was starting to weather, and we've decided to keep it indoors to keep it historically in better shape because it's something I think tradition is an important thing, and because I think tradition is a great morale booster and stuff because it lets you know where you came from. So the Citizens but, Academy, but has the been Citizens Academy a lot started, and I, yeah. you know, I was a young patrolman at the time, and um, so it probably started back in the '84s, '85s, and I sort of thought the sergeant maybe was like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, this isn't what policing is about. But, mm -hmm. you know, that was the beginning of the, the visions of community policing. And, you know, we've been running them strong. We, we'll, we, we had to take a brief hiatus, uh, mm -hmm. and, but we're starting up another academy class in, in March, so we'll be pushing out for that. The great thing about that is that it, it really teaches people about what policemen do. And it's not just policemen because one of the things that most people don't understand is that we work with so many different agencies and this is an opportunity for people to come in you bring them into your house they get to know offices you know you want them to meet all the different offices they get to go out for ride-alongs with them they get to interact with them and I, I think they begin to realize that they actually begin to realize the complexity of the police department how it interacts with other agencies inside and outside because they, they don't realize that there's so many things that we do with different agencies in here, and there's so many when there's how we relate to different problems and problem solve. What's your long view of how you would like to see the police department continue to evolve in the context of 21st century policing? Most of this goes uh, with sort of the changing of society and where the mm -hmm. problems, I think, one of the difficult things that's in the policing field with the opioid mm, epidemic, yes. the overdoses, the, with the mental health issue, we're the first people responding to those all the time. We're dealing with it. So what we're trying to do is to partner ourselves with different agencies uh, involved in that, the healthcare industry, the mm. you know addiction places, so that we can work on the substance use disorders with people and, and realize that it's, it is a disorder. Mental health is a problem. Um, right now, we're in the process of training all our officers um, on, on mental health issues. Um, we, we've signed up to, you know, basically a program, one mind, the One Mind Pledge, which is through the Chiefs of Police Association, to, to train police departments. So there's a big push right now. And it, it's a real commitment because um, we want every officer to go through at least an eight-hour course, and we're trying to push at least the, as many as we can through the 40-hour course. Mm -hmm which is a week long, and that training becomes a difficult issue for us. Drug addiction, um, you know, can be a leading cause of, of crime because they need to support those habits. That's right. So if we can stop that at a lower level, I think we'd be much better off, and I think that's the effort, and that's where the focus is going. And what's happening now is that what, the things you do as an officer consume more of your time. When you do this kind of stuff, it takes more time. So, you know, um, I think when I first started on, it was times that we could, you could go out and get three drunk driving arrests in a night, you know. Um, and a lot of that was because you, the, the, 
the paperwork and everything else that went along with it was so much less. Everything that we do now is documented and viewed and videoed and there's so many reports that need to be filled out. Everything we do is much more time consuming now mm -hmm. and that's sort of mm -hmm. tough to measure because sort of like when you look at statistics, your statistics may be going down because the officers are spending two hours instead of 20 minutes uh, working on solving problems. And when we look at the advent of technology that has now come into, into policing, whether it's surveillance cameras, integrated cameras, and now we're starting to see more and more of body cameras on, on officers. What's your overall uh, view of using technology uh, in this context of 21st century policing? And I think that's, you know, I often talk about culture of when you grow up in generational culture. Um, I am not a computer person. <laughs> um, I struggle with them. I struggle mm -hmm. with technology. Um, the new generation just accepts it. You know, I always said, if you need help with the computer, go find a five-year-old. They'll tell you how to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, this, it's just secondhand to these people. So we spent the last three years uh, really trying to update all our technology and stay on course with it. Um, we have the, uh, all the cruisers now have video cameras in them. So they're documenting the stops and stuff. Most of the studies have shown that video cameras on the police end and video cameras, the, the personal worn cameras, uh, actually are better off and, and they actually protect the officers from false claims and everything. Mm. And most studies are pretty much on board with that. I think the thing we struggle with it, I, I actually priced it out for our department and it's close to $100,000. Um, because there's a lot of, the to, to put, to cameras. equip every, because mm. it's, you really need to have every officer have his own. The best way to do it is just to have everyone issued one uh, when they come on the job. Um, but it's the data that, and it's the storage that capabilities mm -hmm. that you have to really, you need to have servers, you need to have Wi-Fi to download them so that they automatically download. And then there's, you know, I, I, think, I think officers had a resistance for them at first, but I think as the time moves on, sure. you're gonna see less and less, because I think it's gonna actually prove out that it's a good thing. But with that, um, you know, we think that you have to look at it from the other aspect because that's being filmed or everyone that's mm -hmm. being, they don't necessarily like that. Right. You know, how is that going to affect when you're interviewing somebody? Are they going to be less likely to talk to you because they know you're on camera? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things. I think police departments thought when Miranda rights became a thing that we would no longer be able to catch a bad guy and the world would mm -hmm. come to an end and crime would be rampant in the cities. And, you know, that didn't prove out to be. So I think, right. you know, this is just, again, adapting to, the, to what's out there and learning to live with it. To touch on a personal level um, for just a moment, sure. bear with me on this. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a family here on the South Shore uh, where a number of our extended family members are and were in law enforcement. I still have cousins who are still active with the Boston Police Department, with the Stoughton Police Department and others. Um, and when we as young men of color growing up in our home, my dad would sit us down, my brothers and I, and would have what's called the talk. The talk was about being respectful and most importantly, surviving the encounter with law enforcement. Yeah. And if you show respect, the hope is that you get respect in return which is to say, <clears throat> today, fast forward, we, in some cases, as parents, we fail to complete that linkage of teaching our children the importance of the talk. Now, the officer is going to come up to the car and is going to ask you for your license and registration. The most important thing is, is that to show the officer you are no threat. And so how do you do that? You put your hands up where they can see them at all times. And if your license and or registration's in the glove box, you want to say to the officer, well, my registration's in the glove box or my license is in my wallet. How do you want to proceed? I mean, yeah. that's how we were taught. Yeah, you know, I think that's very good, good approach. And, you know, you bring up a touchy situation. Talking about race is such a difficult subject. It makes people uncomfortable. Um, because we, we're, we're so afraid that we're going to talk about something we shouldn't. Um, 
that they were going to touch on subjects that we don't know that much about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't want to get off the, the whole idea of, you know, how to deal with the motor vehicle stuff, but I mm -hmm. think it, it is crucial that, you know, um, I struggled deeply with the whole idea of the Black Lives Matter thing, mm -hmm. uh, subject. And um, because it's like, you know, I, I don't quite get that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't under, what, and what I mean by I don't get it is that I don't really understand it because I didn't live it. But, you know, these are things that you had to think about mm -hmm. that I never had to face. Mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years really sort of trying to figure this out in my own mind. And I, and I think that's where we need to learn as a society. We don't talk about things. We don't talk yeah. about suicide. We don't talk about even the drug issues. We don't talk about the race issues. We're so afraid to talk mm -hmm. openly with each other about these things. Um, and, you know, and we need to get them out in the open. We need to deal with them. Um, we need to educate ourselves. And the only way to educate about these things is to talk about them, just like you and I are talking about them right now, because yes. Americans have to learn that. Nothing's gonna change overnight, but we need to be on the path towards change. You know, so, so that someday, you know, we, we don't really have to have that talk with our kids about right. how you should be respectful to an officer and how you should do these kind of things. Do you remember the show, Jerry Williams? You probably grew up with this. Jerry Williams was a guy on WRKO um, oh, yes. Jerry Williams was not really a lover of law enforcement, and his whole show was basically based upon encounters with law enforcement. It, it was other things, but, and I used to ride it around during the day, daytime, and I would actually listen to it. But you know, the most common complaint I heard from people, they didn't like the way officers approached them and just went up and said, license and registration. And at the time, that's how we were taught. Yeah. You'd walk up to the car, you'd take a defensive position behind the driver, um, and you ask for a license or registration. And after listening to that show and people talking about it, I, I started saying, good afternoon, good evening, how are you doing? This is why you're being stopped. Could you, you know, could I have yeah. your license or registration, please? And, you know, I noticed an instant difference. Because, first of all, you encountered them in a more friendly way. Um, the biggest question is, is, you know, you're driving a car. Listen, I, I'm no different. I've been in the police department for 39 years. If I drive by a cruiser sitting on the side of the road, I uh, instantly take my foot off the gas and look yep. at the speedometer, right? Yep. It, it's exactly. like, right. It's, it's just human instinct. Reflex. You're born with that, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. So I think this gives us the opportunity, you know, when you, when you encounter somebody, it's like, well, well people are afraid. Um, you know, what did I do wrong? Am I going to get mm -hmm. in trouble? And the easiest way to diffuse that is to be friendly. And then just tell them, this is why I stopped you. And then they go, oh, okay, you know? Yes. You know, I think just how you change a little thing can make such a huge difference in how you approach someone, so. How it came to be a movement, perhaps as a result of the actions of a few, yeah. the bad actions of a few, because not all police officers are bad. And like in any profession, and we know that we have bad actors, we have bad athletes, we have bad teachers, we have, there's, there's, there's always that small percentage that gives the profession a black eye. And it's unfortunate that that has occurred in a way that has caused other people to want to say, whoa, wait a minute, you know, this is, this is, an injustice that needs to be addressed. But that's the experience that we hope is not lost when professionals like yourself retire in the next five plus years. Oh, that is, this is the kind of, I call it critical conversations. Yep, yeah. To, or better yet, courageous conversations when you consider the fact that, gee, let's have a courageous conversation about race. Yeah. Let's have a courageous conversation about what I see, what you see, what our beliefs are, where are we common? Where's the common ground in all of this? So as an example, in an encounter with a police officer, let's say on a routine traffic stop, everybody wants to go home at the end of that day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If that is our goal, we all agree <laughs> that we want to go yep. home at the end of the day, yeah. how do we get there? 
I know you got your job to do, and if I went through a stop sign or I didn't signal or my tail lights out, let's have that conversation. I will acknowledge I screwed up, and let's both be able to successfully exit the encounter yeah. and be able to make it home safely. No one likes getting caught doing something wrong, right? right? Yeah. And, I, and I think the idea is that's part of our job. We're not looking at, it's not a personal thing. I didn't just looking to target you. Um, you know, I'm running radar. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't tell me who it is. It's just I pick up a car that's going too fast and we stop it. You know, we try not to engage too much out on the street with people because, it, it, you know, you, the last thing you want to, it, there's a, a delicate balance because you don't want to get into an argument with somebody out on the street, but you also want to educate them enough so that they understand and, and you prevent that from going away. You know, you don't want to make it that personal issue because the officer really isn't targeting it. And I've had people say that to me. It's like, well, you're just doing this because of this or that. And they're like, no, I just did this because the radar said you were going 45 and a 30. Like, and it told me that, like, you know, way up the top of the hill there, mm -hmm. I couldn't possibly see who was sitting in the, the, the car driving at that time. You know, so right. I mean, that's my basis for the stop. It has nothing to do with who you are or where you are or where you're coming from or where you're going. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes you can, if you talk nicely, or, or you, you can sort of bring that out on the stop without it. And that's that whole idea of saying, this is why I stopped you. Yes. I had you on radar. This yes. is what happens. And, you know, sometimes if you explain to people those reasons in a, in a very simple way, you know, they'll at least uh, say, well, they may not agree with you, but, um, you know, they go away, not happy, but they go away understanding. You know, and this is exactly what I tell my kids. If you go into a job interview, you want to put on your best, you know, your best performance. You want to look good. You want to be polite. You want to be, you know, to me, that's something you should be doing all the time. Everywhere you go or everyone you encounter, you you know, you, people, no matter what happens, it's that first impression. Because people do respond to how you respond to them. And, you know, I think, you know, so be respectful. You'll get respect back. And I think that's a, a, a good thing, you know. Chief, how many more years you got before you catch up to your brother and retire? Well, let's see. I, if, I, if I stay here till I'm 65, I definitely got him beat because then I'll be... Uh, well, I have then, I'll be like 43 years. 43 so, years, yeah. so you have yeah. beat by two. So I'll have beat by a couple, yeah. yeah. So it yeah. could just be yeah. a month. I don't really mm -hmm. care. It just has to be more than him. It doesn't, you know. Sure. What <laughs> do you want your legacy to be? I, I think uh, my legacy would be that at some point in time, um, when people look back and they look at the wall over there with all that cheese on it, that at least some people are going to say, you know what, he was a pretty good guy. Um, that, that's, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm doing this job because I want to do it. Um, respect and everything is a great thing, and I hope that that will come. But if it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm, I'm doing this because I want to do it and I enjoy it. And that's what I want to see. You know, hopefully my legacy will be that I did succeed at that. Um, that, you know, I want to be like, well, he was a jerk sometimes, but he wasn't a bad guy. You know, I try to, I've tried to live by the theory that if I don't want to, I, I wouldn't ask someone to do something that I wouldn't do myself. And I, I think to me that's something that most good leaders and most good people try to live by. What do you do t for relaxation? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know. At the I'm, end of the day, <laughs> when you take the uniform off. Well, I, 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 I uh, most of it's family related. Um, you know, I, I like the outdoors. In my retirement, I'll be able to do a lot of hiking and uh, sightseeing and, you know, I'm going to be doing some of the Appalachian Mountain Trail or something nice, like that. Nice. You know, I think nature yeah. is such a beautiful thing and it's one of the true places that I can sort of lose myself. Family is a lot to me and I hope eventually, um, you know, we can do some more fishing and activities. That's right. You know. Chief, look, I want to thank you. Well, thank you. I, I want to thank you. First off, thank you for your continuing service. Well, thank you. Um, and as they say in our home, you know, that thin blue line is what separates us from peace and anarchy.